Welcome back to the No Referees Podcast. I'm your host, Everest Akajobi, bringing you another quarantine edition of our podcast. You can always find us on our social media pages at No Referees Pod and on our new YouTube channel, No Referees Podcast. We have a very, very special guest today. He's the CEO and founder of Green Sports Management. He's a certified representative of FIBA and the National Basketball Players Association. I'm not sure if he likes his Air Max and Jays more than his Miami Heat championship ring. <laughs> you can find him on Instagram at dgreen23. You can also check out his Green Sports Management uh, social media pages at Green Sports MGMT. Our family and friend of the show, Daniel Green Sr. How you doing, sir? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me on, on, on tonight. Man, I'm doing great, brother. Hey, man. One of the first questions we ask all our guests, man, we're going to get back to your, 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 your college basketball days in a minute. Okay. This show, no referees, no yeah. texts, no whistles, no rules. Okay. So I need to know the very first time you had your first run in with a referee and what it was like and what, and what you said. Oh, man. First run in with a referee. I was, I was more of a let my game do the talking type of player. So um, in terms of, you know, having a run in with the referee, um, I kind of I kind of stay quiet and stay poised. I let kind of my, my my teammates, you know, do the riff rapping and the talking with the referees. So uh, you know, I kind of was hands off in that regard. Um, yeah, I, I know you got a technical foul. I know you was like ref. That's a BS something. You gotta get some. <laughs> no, but I do got a story. One of my cousins. So I have a long standing tradition and history in my family of you know playing uh, basketball at a very high level. So one of my cousins actually, uh, not my business partner, sorry, but another cousin that was. You know, very, very, you know, highly sought out. Played in college as well, so we played a lot of AAU together. You know, growing up in New York, City. so um, they would always get into it. Ref, so I, I was always kind of the younger cousin. They always looked out for me. So I remember we we're playing over at Elmcorn Queens um, in this in, in this summer tournament. So this is the first thing that comes to mind. And you know, they they just were hitting me with just some terrible calls. I'm getting going to the hole, not getting any calls. And, you know, my, my, my older cousin, he just had enough of it. So he takes the ball, he spikes it into the stands. You know, he's on, he's kind of the mentality of that New York City test type of mentality type player. So, you know, he ends up getting kicked out the game for me, you know, and so that was kind of my only, you know, kind of biggest running that we've had as a family, you know, in regards to, to, to referees. Here is no rules, no text, no whistles, but there it was no blood. No <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, they didn't want to. They didn't want to scrap after the game, but we, we kind of, you know, everything kind of cooled down, you know, and everything was cool. So <laughs> we're gonna stay right there at the Green family. You know, right. uh, Green Sports Management, with your CEO and founder of. You know, it's a it's a family organization. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, if anyone follows you on your social media page, they'll know that you're very, very huge in family. You know, you just we just recently celebrated Mother's Day. Uh, you and your wife have a beautiful family. You know, let's talk about just what the family aspects means to you and how that helps you and, and what's your day-to-day -day life and how you run your business and run your operation. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, yeah, uh, a huge thing about our agency, you know, um, we actually speak it, we talk it, we live it, we breathe it. You know, we know the game. We have a long-standing family tradition and history of playing, you know, professional sports at, at a very high level. And, you know, it's been a lifelong legacy of ours to have a family-owned sports agency. And that dates back to... Uh, my uncle, Sidney Green, who was a first round fifth pick in a 84 draft to the Chicago Bulls, played with MJ. So, you know, watching the last dance definitely hits home for our family. Um, but he always instilled the principles of honesty and integrity in everything that we do, both on and off the court. Um, and that has laid the foundation for the agency that we have today. Um, and that's kind of what we want to emulate and, you know, kind of pay it forward to the next generation of athlete. You know, those principles of honesty and integrity, doing things the right way. Um, you know, our, our kind of hashtag is we know the game is and literally we know the game you know, on all levels, you know, from the, the, the professional NBA ranks, international basketball, um, as well as from at the Division One collegiate level, you know, and, and, and that's kind of just the, the family, family lifelong tradition and history that we bring to the table as an agency. Your uncle watching that last dance, like you said, so he knew all that Jordan stuff uh, oh, firsthand. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, hey, so you a New York guy. We always hear about Christ the King. You know, we hear about St. John's, uh, Manhattan College. You know, I'm a Texas guy, but I end up, I end up making it to uh, grad school at St. John's. So, you know, the concrete jungle, you know. So we always hear about all these, you know, traditional basketball powerhouses out of New York City. Mm -hmm. How did you end up at Colgate? 
you know what I'm saying, versus at one of these schools in the New York City area? Yeah, great question. So, uh, you know, I attended Poly Prep, which is a prestigious private school, um, great academic and athletic history. Um, you know, coming out of coming out of high school, I'm sorry, you know, and, and when it was time to make a decision for college, um, my high school coach, uh, Bill McNally, who's still a great mentor of mine, you know, great friend of mine, um, you know, he kind of helped, helped me and assisted me with, uh, you know, with my recruiting process. And, you know, the big thing about graduating from, from, from a school like Poly Prep is, you know, all the students go on to, you know, potentially Ivy League schools, Patriot League schools, schools with rich academic and, you know, basketball history. So, um, you know, when, during my senior year, you know, we had a, we had a lot of great players. Um, and also prior to that, um, Joe Kim Noah being one of them and one of my former teammates, Keith Williams, who played with me at Poly, also played with me at Colgate as well. Um, and that paved the way kind of for me, you know, on the, you know to kind of select uh, Colgate as a school. Keith is, you know, still one of my best friends to this day, you know, father of his beautiful daughter that he has. Um, and then outside of myself, we also had, you know, from the women's team at Poly Prep, we also had a great women's player that also, you know, followed us and, you know, went to Colgate. So there was a kind of a, you know, six year period where Colgate got a talent out of Brooklyn, New York. My very, very first D1 job was at Bucknell. Okay. So okay. coming from Dallas, Texas, yeah. you know, went to Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, uh -huh. population five. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You got Midnight's, <laughs> Amish. I never seen none of that stuff before. I know the culture shock was for me. Tell me about the culture shock for you from where you grew up and then going to Colgate. Yeah, huge, huge culture shock. You know, uh, being, you know, four hours, four and a half hours upstate New York. Um, away from New York City, you know, um, it just was different, you know, snowed a lot more than it did in the city, you know, the school was, you know, only 2,800, you know, and that was pretty much the whole entire community of Hamilton, New York, which is where the school was, you know, the closest city to us was uh, at Syracuse, which was about 50 minutes away, but, you know, in college at that time, we didn't have cars, we didn't have ways to move around, I'm coming from New York, I'm thinking, my freshman year, I absolutely was like, this, this is crazy, I can't, I can't be up here still. <laughs> With that, you know, New York, Brooklyn swag, like looking to see kind of, you know, what's there to do around here? You know, there's one bar, literally, one club, and there's, you know, and that's it, you know, and one Chinese restaurant. Outside of that, it's just the campus. But, you know, at the end of the day, I had my teammates, made some lifelong friends. It ended up being a great opportunity. Um, and also, you know, just great, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what it has propelled me to do, you know, to this day, which is being a business owner and a lot of the skills that I, that I developed and learned. You know, during my time as Colgate has prepared me for, for for the real world. Yeah, so you know, the very first time, you know, a brother from the South, you know, we hear Colgate, we think it's a toothpaste. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I, <ain't laughs> so, I, I never heard of Colgate. So like I said, so I got up to the Patriot League. I'm like, yo, all these schools I never heard of before, you know, where are the, the big schools at? But the, like, as you said, you know, you get your students, y'all, you know, they're very good education. I'll go on to be you know, very good business owners, CEOs, different things of that nature. You know, if anybody looks at the Patriot League alumni right. at all these Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100 companies, I mean, you'll see them scattered all over. Once you finish playing at Colgate, what's the next step, you know, before uh, we get to the Miami Heat? What was kind of that in-between time for you? Yeah, it was, um, it was kind of a, a period of kind of just figuring out what's next, you know, in terms of my, my life and in terms of my career. I always knew I had a passion for you know, the business side of sports. So, yeah, I know if I didn't play professionally, you know, obviously, you know, growing up in New York City, that's your lifelong dream. You look up to guys like, you know, Lamar Odom, Stephon Marbury, you know, all of the greats that come out of New York. And you're kind of thinking that you're the next great, the next one to come out. But I always knew, and my, my parents and my family always instilled with me, also my uncle as well, that, you know, always need to have a backup plan if that doesn't come to fruition. So, um, you know, I didn't have the greatest career to be able to, you know, kind of propel and go professional out of Colgate, but I always had in my back pocket that I knew I wanted to work in the business side of sports. So the first thing you think is, hey, you know, be a sports agent. So that was kind of, you know, the first opportunity I got to get into the kind of the industry. Um, reached out to a few people that I knew that were in the industry. And, you know, actually my uncle was able to provide me with someone that he worked with previously who was working with uh, uh, BDA at the time. And then he, he eventually transitioned over and I had an opportunity to, uh, you know, for, that, for an agent that was working with the group that eventually got acquired by CAA. Um, and that was actually the first year that CAA had a basketball division, also a sports division. A lot of people don't know CAA is one of the top agencies now, but, you know, the way they started, where they were just a talent agency, and also just a, uh, you know, for actresses and actors and actresses. 
um, before they, you know, got into the business of sports. And you know, obviously they've done, they've done some amazing, th amazing things. So the name of that group that I worked for was Rose Professional Management. I worked directly for an agent that was part of that group. Uh, the name Rose may be familiar because now Leon Rose became one of the top you know, while, while he was at CAA, has had Carmelo Anthony amongst the mother, you know, a bunch of other players, and now he's the president of the New York Knicks. So, got some extremely high level experience out of school. Um, didn't know that he would be go on to become who he is today. You know, and that group would go on to do what they've done at CAA. But that was a phenomenal experience for me and opened up my eyes to to the entire sports industry. You know, as a whole. Um, shortly thereafter, um, was blessed with an opportunity to to, to kind of work as a full-time business manager with the first round ninth pick of the 07 draft, that player being Joe Kinoa, who's, you know, still a lifelong mind. We actually played high school basketball together in Brooklyn. I was a senior while he was a sophomore. Uh, he saw that I was in the business side of sports and we kind of came up in the ranks together in terms of our careers. You know, me on the business side, him on the playing side, obviously. And, um, you know, he gave me an opportunity to, to, to really, really, you know, get my feet wet in the industry, you know, being his full-time business manager. And I used that experience to start my own sports management consulting agency where I started to work with other players in a similar capacity to what I was doing with Joe Kim. So that was, that, that was for about four or five years. And then I had the opportunity to uh, move to South Florida and, you know, enter into the front office with the Miami Heat, um, which was a phenomenal experience. Um, while I left the Heat, um, that was my first time working on the team side. Prior to that, I was only working on the player side. So it gave me a chance to diversify my skill set, really see how a front office operates, um, you know, so see how teams generate revenue. And so everything that I've learned from the Heat um, and then going on to, you know, the front office, you know, being the Brooklyn Nets, which is my hometown team, all of that prepared me tremendously to, you know, have the confidence and have the ability to start my own, you know, sports agency, which we have today. Um, with all the tools that I developed and learned, you know, from the from a from a business operations platform inside of things, you know, working with these sports franchises. Let's stay right there with the Heat, real quick. So yeah, you were there forward. during the uh, not one, not two, not three, not four, not twenty. You know, you were there during their year. So <laughs> <laughs> give us some backstory just about what it was like being in those front offices, those meetings. You know, did y'all just feel like y'all was gonna win? Like, hey, like, yeah. like how the Bulls, like how Michael Jordan them saying right now on the, on the last dance, like we just knew we were gonna win. Is that what was the feeling like around the Heat then? I remember my first. I'll take you back to my first week with the organization. So um, they usually do their new hirings around that September October time frame. So my first week experience, everybody get uh, receiving their championship rings from the year before because I, I started in two thousand and. 12 so they were coming off that first championship uh when they beat uh okc so uh my first day you know i'm like we better win it again next year because i can't sit through this whole ring ceremony everybody getting rings except for me so um going into that year it was kind of an expectation that you know this is this is going to be the next you know dynasty like the like the bulls you know lebron was at the time you know d wade was at the top of his game chris bosh obviously you know they had a great you know pat riley you know, so it was really, really a, a feel and an atmosphere of, you know, this can this can be a long time. This is a very special moment, you know, in basketball history. So going into that, you know, that season, um, you know, I was excited, you know, on, you know, seeing him every single night, you know, phenomenal player on all levels. Um, D Wade, you know, throwing alley-oops from half court. I mean, it was just special, you know, being a, being a player that grew up, you know, watching the game. You know, I, I looked at it from a different lens than, you know, probably a lot of my colleagues and a lot of my peers just because I knew it was a very special time. And I don't think, you know, not saying that the fans didn't appreciate it, but I, I think that we were a little spoiled in the fact that, you know, this may, this thing may last forever, you know. So I don't know if there was that appreciation factor. I feel like because I lived in Chicago, I lived in New York. I know that at those games, you know, fans are coming in. They're coming in early and they're leaving late, you know. Fans with, with the Miami Heat during the playoffs, as you know, you know, some fans left early, you know, during that game six when Ray Allen said, put those ropes away. So, you know, mm -hmm. we were in the office. I remember that. And I'm watching that game, and I'm like, I can't believe it was this thing, man. You know, the depression that set in among everybody in that office was like nothing I've ever <laughs> experienced. And then when he that, it was straight pandemonium in that office. And, you know, that, that's one thing I'll never forget about that experience. You know, again, a lot of lifelong friends that I developed in the organization, and it was, you know, a phenomenal time to be a part of, especially during that era. Um, hope you know a lot longer, but you know as you know, that things always change in professional sports, and you know obviously LeBron has went on to do some great things, and you know win with Cleveland, start a legacy, and, and you know but definitely very very fortunate to have that opportunity to, to to be a part of the organization. Is Pat Riley really a gangster? Like everybody's saying, he got that real gangster mentality. Come on, give it a real. 
Yeah, I wouldn't say gangster mentality, but he definitely, you know, when you, you feel his presence, he sets a tone when he walks in the room, you know. So, you know, just in terms of for, – for a good reason, you know. I wouldn't say it's, you know, a gangster mentality. I just would say it's just his presence and his legacy and what he's built. You know, you know, we all aspire to if you if you work in this sports, aspire to have a resume, you know, that he has and that weight that he carries when he when he enters a room. So, you know, been fortunate enough to see him firsthand, see how he works, see how he, how he moves, see how he, you know, constructs a front office um, and really, really take a lot of you know bits and pieces from what he's done and, and kind of try to implement that into my business that I run today. So I was a little biased. I, I was with the Spurs for two years. So those are my guys okay. over there. Okay. So and then and then in the off season, I got a chance to train Tracy McGrady in the okay. lockout year two thousand eleven. So I was on. I he was on that bench. <clears throat> they was up like, yeah, T Mac finally don't get a ring. Yeah. He finally don't get a ring. Uh-huh. And man, I was so hurt, man. I ain't gonna lie. Ray Allen hit that shot. I was like, man, <laughs> yeah, my guy T Mac, man, Dang, yeah. he ain't gonna be able to get this ring. Was he, he was right, he, he, right he, there. Was he on that team the next year when they won? No, no, no. He wasn't no. It was just nah, he was gone. He had, he, just, he had just came like he was a late signee, like right, right before the playoff started. You know, he was yeah. one of those. He was one of those signees. So mm-hmm. I was just so hurt, man. I mean, it was a clutch shot of Ray Allen here, but sure. I wanted I wanted him to win that ring so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they went on and got us the following year. But yeah, I mean, I, I feel for you with T Mac, you know. But you know, I got my. <laughs> <laughs> I know when I was with the Spurs, I was with the Spurs um, nine, uh, 2008, 2009, and when we would come to Miami, it was always about, you know, 15 strong and we won team. And that was like their slogan, you know, they're about one guy. And mm-hmm. those, one of my favorite Miami Heat players from then and even till now, all time, is Udonis Haslam. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's one of my favorite guys mm-hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. And even – the all even the the, the corn roll you Donis has on that was like he was a yeah. true. So sure. you were there. So what's one of your favorite Miami Heat players of all time? Favorite Heat players of all time. I mean, I know it's you know kind of cliche, but you gotta you gotta give D Wade the respect you know the respect that's due. You know, just the legacy that he's built. You know, I always, I'm big on that. You hear me saying that a lot. You know, if I can build a family legacy the way that D Wade has built a legacy in Miami. You know, with his name, with his brand, and you know, where, from coming from where he comes from, I don't know if you saw him of the last dance that he had, you know, on ESPN, and you know, that was well. Um, you know, just seeing his, I didn't realize his story was, you know, so deep. You know, coming from from, you know, the inner city. I spent some time living in Chicago as well, and just seeing, you know, what he's been able to accomplish. Hands down, top three shooting guard of all time behind Jordan and Kobe. If you if, if, if you look at it, you know, and you know what he's done for the city of Miami. You know, bringing them three championships. You know, it's, uh, gotta gotta be gotta gotta, gotta give D Wade his credit. Um, outside of that, definitely respect UD and what he's done down here as well. Um, he's a former Gator. You know, so I always heard UD stories from you know my business partner and my cousin Torian Green, who was a two-time national champion. Joe Kimnoa, you know, who was a two-time national champion there as well, and, and a great friend of mine, and you know was a business associate for a number of years. Always paid respect to UD. UD as you know, UD is the is the guy. You know, so. Um, you know, definitely give those two guys credit for what they've done for the city of Miami. I thought you may have said a throwback name like Ronnie Cycli or something. Glenn Wright, one of the guys that, you know, strangely enough, we, we've been able to develop a, a pretty cool, unique relationship. Um, Glenn, he's, I remember Glenn when I was a young kid, play, him playing in Charlotte, you know, he, you know, Glenn's an OG and now he's with the, with the Heat and, you know, we had some time to work together and, you know, develop a relationship with Glenn, you know, got to respect what he's done in his career as well. And, you know, now, you know, turn. 180 and kind of going into that front office role and really, you know, taking ownership of that, being an ambassador and also a scout with the team. He's been doing a phenomenal job. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's talk about that. We get, we get your ring. You know, Drake okay. said, you know, I got a really big team. You know, I need some really big rings. <laughs> I've seen your Instagram page. I've seen the ring on your finger. Talk about sure. the first time you got that championship ring and you put it on your finger, what that felt like. I mean, it was, it was, it was great. Is any, any, you know, growing up, it, you know, working, you know, playing the game that I love, you know, for, for my entire life and, you know, being able to be in the atmosphere and receiving a championship ring, you know, whether I'm playing or not, you know, it's still, you know, something that's invaluable and that's part of something that I live with me forever, you know, has my name on, you know, team on the ring, the one, and that's something that'll definitely be passed down, you know, for years to come to my family. You ever bring that ring out and stun on them when you had an event or something like that? 
Yeah, you usually only bring it out for events, you know. <laughs> 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 you, gotta, you gotta do that. It's a good conversation starter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. before before we get into Green Sports Manager, I just want to touch on your time with the Nets. That's your hometown team. That's what you. Yep. That's what you say. You, you grew up in uh, in that area. You grew up in uh, the, the city. You know, talk about mm -hmm. how that tra how to tra tra transitioning from the Heat going to work for your hometown team. What that was like. No, it was great. It was great. I mean, I was a, a little spoiled with the weather over the past, you know, six or seven going back to Brooklyn, but um, no, it was great just in terms of, you know, I remember when, crazy enough, exactly where the Nets, uh, the Barclays Center is, where the Nets play their home games is, is located. That's where I used to meet up with my teammates for a, 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 a AAU team we played for called Brooklyn USA. So it would be at, you know, Flappers, Flappers train station, and there was nothing there. That arena did not exist at that time. It was just bare and and we would meet on that same intersection of Atlantic and Flatbush. So to fast forward, what, you know, 20 years and me be in and working for that organization, you know, it was, it was kind of a surreal feeling, you know, growing up, you know, 10 minutes away from Barclays Center, you never you would see something like that. And when I get to Brooklyn and, you know, see Barclays Center, I'm like, there's a spaceship in the middle of Brooklyn, the way that building is designed and architected. And I'm going in there every single day, you know, as, as my place of employment. I mean, that, 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 that's just, Real feeling, you know, going back home to work with Brooklyn Nets. Yeah, man, I've been in the Barclays Center a few times. As, as a as people know who watch the show, I've been a strength coach in the NBA. And one of the cool things about the Barclays Center, the loading dock, when you drive that bus down there, that thing uh -huh. spin around like a spaceship, like you said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I never seen that before. That's like one of the, the coolest things I, I I noticed about the arena, and it's just, it feels like an arena, like some basketball gyms. Like, you know, the United Center, for example, to me, I feel like it's so big. But, like, yeah. the Barclays Center feels like an arena for basketball. Yeah, they did a great job with it, you know, in terms of keeping that intimate feeling and in terms of you really – there's no bad seat in the, in the building, you know, when you're in that place. So, they did a phenomenal putting that together. All right, bro, let's get into green sports management, man. Now, I got to ask you a couple things because, sure. you know, this is, this is the, the crux of – you know, while we got you on the show here today, you know, I'm going to hit on a few bullet points. So, so you, like you mentioned, you know, a lot of, a lot of people have the word agent, you know, they don't really know what that means mm -hmm. and what that covers, you know, sure. so just give us like a brief, a real quick overview of the word agent and what your duties entail and what you, you know, what you're doing for your players. Absolutely. Um, you know, before, uh, before I get into that, an agency, you know, no two agencies or two agents are the same. You know, everybody has their own, you know, thought process and business process that they implement in terms of how they work with their players, you know, with my skin, not only the founder and CEO of the agency and also a licensed agent, you know, I kind of wear two hats as a business and then also as, you know, an, an agent for our players as well. Um, you know, so I always said, you know, uh, when, when I first got into the industry, which was my first job out of school, you know, working for an agent, I always said that once I revisit, you know, becoming an agent, and, you know, I want to make sure that I'm doing it under my own terms. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to be in a position to, you know, start this agency and, and, and really, you know, from where we first started as a consultant agency, as I mentioned before, you know, when I was working with Joe Kim to kind of where we are today, you know, to kind of flip that switch when I got fully licensed with the NBA, fully licensed with FIBA and now have our own sports agency. Um, it's pretty much a dream come true and, and kind of the way that, we work with our players and work with our guys, you know, we are a full service agency and we provide, you know, for our guys, uh, six different services that we feel every player, you know, rightfully deserves to have. Obviously some players, you know, certain services that they, you know, kind of work with us on, you know, more so than others, um, just depending on kind of the level of they're at, but kind of the six core services that we provide for our guys are contract negotiation, financial management, marketing and branding, player development, as well as uh, philanthropy consulting and also, uh, you know, concierge services, you know, because every guy, you know, has things that they need to do, you know, whether it be hiring employees, you know, short term, long term rentals, things of that nature. So we have those have that service in there as well. Um, as far as the philanthropy consulting, you know, every player has, you know, a child foundation or, some, or something that they're passionate about that, you know, they feel that they want to give back to. So we thought it was important to include that charitable consulting piece. Um, and then as far as player development, what that entails is, from in-season tra training, out-of-season training, as well as in-draft preparation, going into your first, you know, your first job as 
a professional athlete, whether it be at the NBA level, international level, or G League level. So that's kind of that player development piece. And then the marketing and branding piece is all of your endorsement sponsorships that you have with various brands um, that want to partner with you as a player. But sometimes when they want to partner with you as a player, they sometimes want to partner with your foundation as well, um, just because it just depends on kind of what the mission is. So that's why we also incorporate that charitable piece. Um, and then the financial management piece is, you know, more so everything from, you know, choosing the appropriate financial advisor, you know, the appropriate accountant, uh, the appropriate insurance professional, um, and also the appropriate CPA, because, I, you know, a lot of players don't know going into that first contract or going into that, you're an, you're, you're an NBA player, you got to pay that jock tax on, you know, every single state that you play, you know, in, in every state. So, you know, just making sure that we educate our guys on things, things of that nature. And then obviously the piece that everyone uh, knows about that uh, that agents do is that contract negotiation piece and making sure that players maximize their value and you know understanding what the market value is for each specific player whether it be at the international level you know the the G League level and also the the, the NBA level so that's kind of the six core services that we provide as an agency. One buzzword you always hear is market value. You know what's our mm -hmm. player's market value? How do you how do you determine what a player's market value is? Yeah, great question. So um, his knowledge and you know just research that you do in, in, in your specific field so for example if you if you know that players with this skill set with this analytic report you know shot you know this percentage from the field that you know provided this kind of team value win shares whatever the case may be for his team now you say okay this specific player is greatly compared to this previous player who received this this market value in previous seasons so that's kind of how we equate what a player's market value is comparing him to, you know, two, three, four, maybe five other players that were at his particular skill position, put up similar numbers. And then that's kind of how you can equate what that player's market value is. Now I'm looking at right now, it's a different sport. You know, I'm a Cowboys fan. You see the ongoing stuff with Dak Prescott, you know, his market value, this, that, and the third. Absolutely. You know, it, I understand that, you know, obviously people who don't know that, like people in the NBA and the G League, you know, mm -hmm. majority of those contracts are guaranteed or partially guaranteed, but in the NFL, you know, it's almost like they operate on a one-year deal. You know, they can have you out of there, you know, whenever. You know, so I, I've been really paying attention to that market value thing, you know, because I'm watching that whole De Dak Prescott situation. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely an integral piece to, to, to our business and understanding and knowing and having knowledge of the game, having knowledge of, you know, the history of the NBA. So, I mean, a, a huge – you know, social media phenomena was everybody was, you know, so caught up in, you know, how much Scotty Pippen was paid, you know, during the Bulls. But, you know, at that time, you know, during his first two years, he was receiving, he was still a top player, you know, in the NBA that was being paid. It, it, it kind of, you know, he locked in pretty early, you know, with that contract. So, you know, he kind of was on the downside of, you know, in later years of what he should have been being paid. But at that time, he did receive his market value for what he rightfully deserved. He, he didn't know that there was going to be a new CBA or his agent probably didn't know at the time or, Actually, his agent and Jerry Reinsdorf well said he shouldn't have took that deal because it was such a long-term deal. Um, but at the same time, you know, that was his specific market value at that time, you know, with, with the league having that type of salary cap. So how does a guy coming out, so I look at your roster, your client roster, and mm -hmm. I'm very, very intrigued by that because majority of your roster are, are kind of guys that like the mid-major, mid-major plus kind of mm -hmm. guys um, in college that, you know, maybe not quote-unquote household names. You know, how, how do you, as your agency, identify the talent that you want to go after, you know, versus saying, you know, you're not going to try to go after like your, your, your Zions and these kind of guys, because those guys might get, you know, swallowed up by like your CAA, Bill Duffy, et cetera, et cetera. How do you identify your right talent for, for, your, for your agency? Yeah, great question. You know, um, just kind of knowledge of the game, you know, being a student of the game and also playing the game and, you know, working on in, in the field in various areas. We kind of look for those, you know, number one, high character guys, and then number two, hidden gems that, you know, other agencies, you know, may may, may overlook. Um, we found a great niche with that. And, you know, we, we realized that, you know, we're not, you know, your Excel, we're not your CAA, we're not, you know, Clutch, we're not Rock Nation yet. You know, I always say yet, but in terms of, you know, getting there, you know, we will be on that level of having, you know, that, that, that type of clientele. But at the same time, you know, we're kind of building something organically um, with players that want to, you know, that, that fit that mold and, and criteria of what we're looking for as far as representation goes, you know. Um, kind of internally, you know, we're looking for those, you know, Fred Van Fleets, those Corey Josephs, those Patty Mills, those guys that fly under the radar and go on to have longstanding 5, 10, 15 year careers making, you know, X amount of money. You know, you know, you have five or six or seven of those guys, you know, you have a pretty solid, solid foundation for, for, for business. So that's kind of what we look to aspire to, 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 to kind of go after, you know, when it comes to, 
you know, each class that we bring in. I wanted to make sure that athletes had access to a, to a shooting machine that they could take anywhere. So I came up with the concept to fold it into a duffel bag. I ended up prototyping with my friend Xavier, welding our first prototypes in the garage. I made it for myself. I also made it for the millions of other athletes out there that are trying to reach their dreams and uh, trying to make it out. Give me a little, give me a little inside story. You sat down with one of these guys. Let's just say mm -hmm. one of these mid-major kind of guys yep. who think that think that their head, I'm a, you know, I'm a first rounder. You know, you hear all these kind of stories that that, that had their mama, daddy, cousin, sister, brother, then lied to them or pumped their head up or something. Y'all sit down, y'all evaluate them and give them the real. Uh, give me mm -hmm. a little backstory, something that you know, you, some stuff, some stories you know heard sitting down with a guy that just was maybe delusional about you know the process and you know didn't want to accept your y'all's uh your feedback your information yeah yeah i mean we're, we we kind of we try to steer clear of those guys you know so <laughs> so just give me a little story about man i sat down with this one guy one time man e let me tell you something like that yeah yeah so this is uh this is kind of how we go about our process you know the first two things that we ask our guys you know when we're having these potential recruiting calls is you know what are your expectations you know for your career and what are your expectations for us as an agency you know, if we get any type of answers that are delusional and not on par with, you know, who we are as an agency, we say, you know what, thank you for your time. We don't think this is probably going to be the right agency for you. And we kind of move, move on. But, um, you know, obviously there's, there's a few times that we, 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 we do, you know, entertain those type of calls. But, you know, it's kind of in a situation where it's, you know, you take the call and, 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 and time and time is of the essence for us. So if there is a situation like that, we don't really have a chance to kind of you know, entertain that type of type of stuff. So we kind of just move on and just say, you know, we'll, we'll be in touch from there. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish, I had, wish I had a story, um, but, you know, nothing comes Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just saying, like, I, 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 I've been around college guys, and yeah. inside some of them, the, the 15th man on the team may feel like he's yeah. a first-round draft pick. You know, yeah. somebody done pumped his head up or something. Yeah, tell well, we, did, we, did, we did run into a guy, um, you know, that we were – you know, entertaining and thinking about working with. And, you know, he would, you know, we kind of learned our lesson early in the industry. You know, he would call us pretty much every other day. He'd be like, hey, this guy just got released from Atlanta. You know, you, you're, not even a, you're not even a prospect yet for the G League or, you know, you're borderline international, like calling us every day. Hey, the Hawks just opened something up. Hey, the Nets just opened up this, this spot. This guy got, got released. Hey, uh, you know, Jeremy Lin. You know, he's out of this, he's out of this situation. Think I got a spot over? I'm like, can you call that team for me? I'm like, I, I don't think this is going to work out, you know? So that, 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 that's kind of why we always set that precedent of saying, hey, you know, what are your expectations for your career? And what are your expectations for us as an agency so that we can alleviate it, you know, not have to have those type of, you know, situations where we're not on the same page. Because I think that's, you know, communication, transparency is extremely important in any relationship. And, you know, we got to be aligned in terms of that in terms of getting to where you, where you need to be to accomplish your goals. So. Another one of y'all core values, financial management. Now, these guys, when they get this, get this contract, they want to go blow a bag. They mm -hmm. want to go, go buy the drip. They want to go buy the whip. You know what I'm saying? Sure. They want to go buy the house. How do y'all educate these guys on to be smart with their finances and still they can still, you know, have a little fun with their, you know, their hard work and things of that nature, but to be smart at the same time? Of course. Um, yeah. I mean, so in terms of the actual financial management piece, you know, we don't do the actual financial planning. We don't do the actual, you know, financial advising. We leave that to the experts. And that's why, you know, we have a team of advisors that we know and trust in the industry from, you know, some of the top, you know, banks around around the country to, to, to kind of assist us through that process. You know, we don't select the primary financial advisor for our guys or an accountant or, you know, an insurance professional for our guys. What we kind of do is we say, hey, here's three individuals that we know trust in each specific field and then we kind of sit down um similar to a call like this interview each of them and see which one is going to be a good fit for 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 our guys um you know and just kind of knowing the the the, the, the psychology of an athlete and understanding how players work you know we know that some guys are you know a little bit more you know uh, cavalier uh, cavalier with their spending <laughs> exactly so, so we know that we're probably going to need someone that's a little bit more you know strict on the side and more you know i guess traditional in the sense of Make sure that he's, you know, on top of his spending and his budgeting and his, you know, his asset allocation. 
Um, and then guys, you know, certain guys that aren't as, you know, fruitful with their spend, you know, we know that he probably would fit well with another type of advisor. So that's why we don't have one specific, you know, team of advisors that we select for our guys. That's why we have, you know, multiple people that we, that we work with. But, um, yeah, that's kind of how. And then, and then we're knowledgeable enough in, you know, each specific area. Um, on our team, our VP of business operations, you know, he spent 14 years on Wall Street. So, you know, he's very, you know, well-versed in terms of, you know, financial, you know, planning and things of that nature. So he assists us, you know, you know, uh, with all of those guys when it comes to those decision-making opportunities and overseeing, you know, our players' portfolios and, and, and so on and so forth. You know, I know I, I, had, I got a couple of guys that played in the D League before the G League. Man, these guys would just walk around and just blow money like, as if they were in the NBA. You know, yep. barely got on a seat contract. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? What, what's kind of some story you heard from some of the guys like, yo, dude, you tripping right now? <laughs> um, yeah, there's a few. There's a few stories where a guy with guys <laughs> tripping. And, and it's more so, it's not, I wouldn't, it, it's more so, it's not, it's not the player's fault because as you know, you know, coming from the, you know, you know, you know, so, uh, so lower socioeconomic backgrounds, you know, this is kind of your, you know, first chance to really show that you made it. And that's kind of, you know, unfortunately, that's, that, that's the mentality of some guys. And, you know, you're, you know, you know, you may be on a rookie contract or a smaller contract and you're trying to keep up with the Jones. You're trying to keep up with, you know, the guy that's been in the league eight, 10 years, you know, that's making, you know, 10, 15 million, you know, you're making, you know, for a percentage of that, you know, so, you know, when it comes to those type of situations, you know, we just try to educate our guys and let them know, hey, you know, your time is coming where you do, where you will be in a position to afford that if you do the right things early on in your career. Um, but at the same time, you know, you got to be conscientious of, you know, how you're spending your budgeting um, so that you can, you know, eventually, you know, be in a position to, to, to make those type of purchases. So we just try to educate our guys as much as we can. At the end of the day, as we know, guys are going to make the decisions that they want to make, but all we can do is kind of be that advisory voice and let them know, hey, here's the pros and cons of each decision that you make. And that's why we, you know, again, that alludes back to what are your expectations for your career and what are your expectations for, you know, us as an agency. And that, that's part of it. That's why we set that precedent, set that tone that, you know, we got to be aligned. We got to be on the same page in terms of what, you know, what you're doing, you know, not only on the court, but also off the court. Being a performance coach, you know, know how much all that off-season training, you know, one of the big things that actually caught my eye initially when I researched green sports man management was the player development piece, mm -hmm. athletic training and nutrition, uh, strength coaches like myself, um, mental coaches, you know, all things of that nature. You know, talk about that piece that you guys add, uh, add as well in there uh, that will basically have a 365 component to, to the athlete. Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, just going into, you know, kind of building a brand, building the agency, um, you know, we realize that that's an inter integral part in terms of a player's, you know, longevity and career, you know, having the right, you know, preparedness, you know, not only in season, but off season, also pre-draft preparation as well. Um, with that said, you know, we built great relationships with, you know, different trainers around the country, great facilities around the country. Um, you know, one of the, one of the first introductions that we had to that player development piece was a gentleman by the name of Joe Bunasar, who's based out of Vegas, who actually did, uh, Torian Green, who's my business partner and cousin, his pre-draft preparation when he was a second round 52nd pick in the 07 draft. And, you know, just seeing how Joe worked and operated with his staff and kind of all of the things that he put in line to prepare these guys, you know, for, for, for life as a pro. Uh, kind of stuck with me early on in my career and early on in Torian's career. And we realized that when we're, when we're in a position to start our agency, we need to align with, you know, facilities, you know, and trainers, you know, of, of, of Joe's caliber. So, you know, fast forward, you know, 14 years, you know, since, you know, meeting Joe and, you know, kind of knowing what we need to do to get our guys prepared and, and then have them have those longstanding careers. You know, we've, we've formed strategic alliances with a few trainers here in the South Florida area, as well as up in New York, some in Dallas you know, some in Vegas, some in LA, just depending on regionally where our guys are. Um, here in South Florida, um, you know, prior to Corona, you know, attacking and, and, and affecting obviously every single industry, you know, we were looking at rolling out a GSM, Green Sports Management Player Development Program for, you know, guys that were in transition to, you know, from collegiate to, to the pros, you know, not only if they were going to be, you know, a potential draft pick or a potential NBA player um, or a potential G League player, but also for our international guys as well to get them in the mindset of, okay, this is how you need to be thinking, acting, and performing, and the work that you need to be doing on a consistent basis, not only when you're a rookie, but also when you're going into being a veteran and, and during your offseason. So it's more so a mindset. We realized, you know, last season that, you know, some of the biggest things that these players, that especially the players that went overseas, um, you know, you got a lot of time on your hand, you know, in terms of, you know, you're playing, you know, you're practicing maybe four or five times a week, and then you're playing maybe one or two times a week. So, you know, you're not in college anymore. No one's telling you when to go to class. No one's telling you when to wake up. No one's telling you when to go to study hall. 
no one's telling you, you know, all of those things. So you, a lot of those things you got to do on your own. So, you know, what we've done with this player development program is kind of set your itinerary and set your daily schedule for, you know, six to seven days a week where, you know, I just kind of walk you through what Mondays may look like for our guys. You know, you wake up, have breakfast, and from there you have your in-season, I'm sorry, yeah, your off-court training, then you have your on-court training, followed by some type of, you know, low-intensity workout, whether it be yoga, pool workout, um, more so injury preventative measures, just to make sure that our guys are getting that, you know, getting that blood flow going still, because you're going extremely hard during this period, you know, during the off-season as you prepare for your first pro opportunity, um, followed by, um, you know, rest and recovery or rehab if you have any nagging injuries, at least, you know, once every other day, you know, whether that be Normatec, cryotherapy, cold tub, um, you know, different type of measures to, to, to really make sure that you're, again, injury preventative measures to make sure that you're taking care of your body. Um, followed by, you know, a little bit of time off. You have dinner and then later that night, you potentially may play pickup or maybe play some type of competitive basketball just so you're still developing, you know, that basketball IQ and still thinking the game. So that's kind of what the daily regimen, you know, looks like, you know, for guys that would come down to our, for, you know, facility that we have access to down here and work with us and work with our trainers. Um, in addition to that, you know, we still provide our guys with that calendar and that schedule that they can take with them, you know, if they can't make it down here or if they're going to continue to train at school or train back home. You know, just having them, and they don't have to follow every single thing line by line, but just having that type of platform and regimen to, like I said, start to begin to thinking, acting, and developing as a pro, um, you know, that's kind of what we put in place for our guys in that player development piece. Yeah, since some of them guys in Chicago, man, I got the weight room, I got the facility, I got the court, sure. all that. Send them up to me, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so another, another guy that, uh, you know, kind of was, you know, one of the grandfathers to, to, to this, uh, you know, pre-draft and off-season training was, you know, got his base out of Chicago, Tim Grover, you know, got a chance to see his facility back in the day when, you know, that was up and running. And, you know, he would have all types of pros coming through, you know, Antoine James, I'm sorry, Antoine Walker, uh, you know, Sean Marion, you know, Joe Kim was over there. You know, they had, they had some pretty good runs over there. You know, Kobe used to go out there and work out with him, obviously, he was Kobe's trainer. Um, that was MJ's first train. I saw him, you know, he was in the last dance and, you know, just, just having that mindset and seeing how those guys, you know, really took their training and, you know, serious to the off season is you know, why these guys went on to be, you know, legends of the game, you know, so, um, and that's right there in your backyard in Chicago, as you know. Yeah, I've been over to attack. I went over to attack a few times when I was with the Spurs and some of our guys would work out over there in the off season. And that's, yeah. you know, obviously every year the combine, they have stuff over there uh, every year just to see that it's still, you know, I drive by it every day when I go to work. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And that's where they have, uh, they have pre-draft there now. Um, that's where the combine is. That's where they have, uh, what else they have? The G League Invitational is there. So, you know, still make, still make my way back to Chicago pretty often throughout the year, you know, over at that facility. You know, it's funny just seeing, you know, kind of what that's developed into and, you know, what they're doing in the program that they're doing out of there is incredible. You know, there's a lot of new news coming down with the G League. Like a, lot, a lot of buzz where high school guys are, are are passing up on opportunities to play D1 to propel into the G League with this uh, uh, new program they have. Uh, you know, the contracts have now, you know, back in the day, they were the, the A, A, B, C, D, E, F, G contracts now back then. And a lot of things have changed. You know, talk about – just your involvement with the G League and some of your, your guys and, you know, what, what the G League, how, how it's uh, evolved over the years. Yeah, I think, the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the G League and I always tell our guys, you know, the G League is, is, is a great situation, a great opportunity, um, but it has to be the right situation for you specifically as a player. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you're going to be a, you know, especially for a rookie, if you're going to be a top six to eighth guy in rotation on a G League roster, you know, and a team or a GM or a coach is giving me that kind of guarantee that that's going to be your position in the G League, I think it's phenomenal because what that does is just does a few things. Not only does it, one, you know, if you play well, put you on a radar of a few NBA teams to kind of move up, you know, during that season or in preceding seasons. Um, that's one, one thing that it does for you. And two, if you go over to the G League and you play well, you know, that sets you up pretty nice for a pretty lucrative contract internationally as well. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of what the G League has done, the platform that it's created. Um, it has given the guys a chance to, you know, also stay home and, and play rather than having to, you know, just only choose an option to go overseas. Um, and it's also been great in terms of what they've been doing with these, you know, with the two-way player contracts where, you know, guys can earn up to a certain X amount of dollars and they're really developing these guys to, you know, be NBA players, be on an NBA roster, you know, full-time. Um, also with these Exhibit 10 contracts that they have where a guy, if he goes to training camp, they can keep, you know, up to, you know, four of the six guys that they released from training camp of an NBA team and put them with the G League and still continue to develop them throughout the season. Um, so I think that's great, you know, in terms of the development piece that they have. It's really become a developmental league for, you know, guys, as long as it's the, the right situation for that specific player. 
Um, outside of that, you know, kind of coming in, you know, this year, you know, with these new contracts that they're providing for, you know, high school elite players, I think is absolutely phenomenal. Um, a lot, I don't know if a lot of people don't know, but last year they tried to roll out a, you know, a, a G League select contract. You know, I believe it was about, you know, 125K um, for, for guys coming out of high school, but none of the players passed up on it. You know, the top two guys that we, that they thought probably would, would bite at it was, you know, obviously RJ Hampton and Lamella Ball, and they opted to go to Australia, um, you know, for, you know, a little bit more money. And, and, and at the same time, you know, that, that's kind of, I believe, why the G League said, hey, we got to do something to change that because we can't be losing our great talent to, you know, be going to play overseas and, and, and these other pro pro countries when we have a system in place here with the G League that's going to be great for their development. And uh, I, just, I just think it's remarkable, you know, what they've been able to do and the way that they've been able to bridge the gap and really show that relationship and that correlation between being a G League player and being being an NBA player as well and just the working relationship that each organization has. Now, I'm going to put you in a tough spot right here because a lot of college a lot of college coaches are pissed off about this new thing. You know, they're, they're a little pissed. And you were a college guy. And now you're on this side. You know, which side, which side are you pro? You, the, the, the college, kids going to college, you know what I'm saying? Or kids going and get this bag? Um, like I said, man, it has to be the right situation. You know, it depends. It, 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 each, each, each player is different. You know, it has to be the right situation for each specific player. So um, for guys that are, you know, of that high school elite, you know, if you're, if you're a projected lottery pick going into your freshman year, you know, once you graduate, you know, I mean, not graduate, but once you – you know, declare and you're going to be a projected lottery pick. Obviously, it may make sense to you know get an early season in and develop that during that during that year, rather than playing on the college campus. You know, at the end of the day, you know they never hold back. You know, just you know people that are are gifted academically from pursuing a you know opportunity to work for a Fortune 500 company if they can do the job. So I don't understand. I don't I don't see why they should be able to do that for you know guys that are high level athletes that you know can contribute right away to you know, know uh, whether it be a G League or an NBA system. So, you know, obviously, like I said, it has to be the right situation for a specific guy. I don't think that it's going to kill completely college basketball because you still have a ton of talented players that are still going to play at the college level. But it's for those select few guys that can, you know, kind of fit that mold and fit that criteria of being ready to, you know, compete at that level. Um, you know, I'm never going to, you know, tell a kid not to pursue an education, you know, prior to, to, to going professional. But, at the same time, you always need to look at, you know, the pros and cons of every single situation and, and make the, 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 right, the right decision. You was a college athlete at one point in time. Okay. So yeah. what, what, how would you have felt to get some dollars off your likeness to go to Walmart and set up a little shop and sign some autographs or something like that? I mean, of course. I mean, I think, I think these players, you know, definitely deserve it. They make their universities a ton of money. And, it's, you know, it's a specific, you know, it's, it's one or two sports that are, pretty much, you know, providing all of the resources economically for the entire NCAA. So, you know, there, there should be something structured in place where cer certain players or, you know, certain sports are compensated for what they're doing. Um, I, I understand it could be, you know, kind of a, a slippery slope if you provide those benefits for every single athlete, which you probably need to do in this case. But, I mean, I definitely think, you know, it is a full-time job. You know, being a former, you know, college athlete, you know, not only do you have a full workload, but you're also, you know, playing and, and, and traveling and up to 30 to 40 hours a week, you know, outside of your academic studies. Granted, you are getting a scholarship, you are receiving, you know, uh, a scholarship to attend the university. But at the same time, I think that certain guys, especially at those, you know, top 25 universities, um, you know, are contributing a lot more than what that scholarship, you know, value is. So, you know, there needs to be something figured out, you know, and I think, I don't know if this new rule that they implemented where guys can make money off their likenesses that, end all be all answer but you know it is a start to, to, to what potentially can be done for these guys so that's where I'm at in terms of the, my thoughts on it you guys mm -hmm. have partnered with guys like Bam Adebayo um, Hassan Whiteside talk about what those type of relationships are you partner with those guys with their foundations you know, just give us a little insight on how how those things work yeah great question so um you know kind of you know, kind of dating back to kind of the, the, the history of green sports management and, you know, kind of what we were founded upon. So, you know, I mentioned, you know, while working, you know, in Chicago with Joe Cano and using that experience to start my own sports management consulting agency, um, which originally started as green sports management consulting. Um, a huge piece to that was marketing and branding and also, you know, charitable foundation consulting. Um, so with that, you know, when I entered into the front office, I kind of put that consulting piece on the back burner just because, you know, I had these full-time positions with the, you know, the Heat and also with the Nets. 
Um, a primary responsibility of my of, of my job responsibilities was, you know, generating revenue for those organizations, you know, uh, the, those uh, professional sports teams. So I really, really became familiar with kind of the sponsorship piece, the the, the, the marketing partnership piece of kind of, you know, how the team side operated in that in that respect. And so, you know, that provided me a platform to kind of say, hey, I could do the same thing that I'm doing on the team side and also provide value to the players. So with that said, you know, that that's kind of opened up, you know, how I was able to form these partnerships with these specific players, um, you know, from a marketing partnership standpoint. And, you know, a lot of brands, again, um, as I alluded to before, sometimes brands want to partner specifically with just the player, but sometimes they also want to, you know, know a little bit more about the player. What is the player passionate about? What does the player believe in? It's giving back to the community. So, you know, with that said, with certain players, you know, that's where the, the piece of, uh, you know, developing marketing partnerships with that specific, with those two specific players, especially that you mentioned, you know, kind of came to fruition where, you know, we provided marketing partnerships for their specific foundations. We're able to do some, you know, extremely high level, you know, events, you know, social mixers, camps, um, you know, really, really promoting who they are as a player, but also also promoting what their initiatives are off the court. So um, me personally, you know, philanthropy and giving back to the community has always been, you know, a lifelong passion of mine. Um, my older sister, she was a school teacher. Um, she, you know, my first jobs, you know, when I was kind of, you know, in middle school, you know, she also was the director of, you know, different nonprofits and things of that nature. So, you know, I would always work in the community, work with the youth. So, you know, when I was in a position to be able to provide that on the platform that I have, you know, through, you know, professional athletes, I thought it was a no brainer and I thought that it was a great synergy just because, you know, it's always great to give back um, to, the, to the community in that respect. Do you ever have guys that want to give back to the community or they have a, they want to do something, they want to have a foundation, they want to have a nonprofit, but just don't know what to do or that they just are stuck in a crossroads or maybe they had, they have something they already started and yeah. don't know what to do with it. You know, how do you guys give them the right direction on those kinds of situations? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, a lot of guys that we work with, they, they are young and they don't know kind of what they're passionate about. They don't know what they want to do yet. And so kind of the, 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 I say it's, you know, it has to be the right timing again for when you're ready to start your own foundation or start whatever, you know, initiative it is that you're, that you're passionate about. But in the meantime, you know, what we try to do is provide a kind of an ecosystem and a platform where, you know, you don't have to do everything from A to Z right now. You know, let's, let's figure out, you know, maybe two or three foundations that, you're, you know, that, that, that you share the same goal, the same mission of you know, in your community and maybe partner with them, you know, for an event, for an appearance or uh, whatever the case may be, just so you can kind of get your feet wet and kind of, you know, do something that, you know, is, is positive in the community and kind of understand how this side of the how this side of the industry, you know, when it comes to philanthropy uh, planning works. So, you know, for example, me personally, you know, I, I work with two different foundations. I don't have my own foundation yet, but I, that's something that I do aspire to have. Um, but, you know, I, I am a part of the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Um, I ran for, you know, they had a, a pretty fun event where, you know, I ran for Man of the Year where we did, you know, a pretty cool fundraiser to, and, 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 and it was culminated with the gala at the end of the year where that money and proceeds went back to the community for, you know, students that, not students, but children and families that were affected by leukemia uh, and lymphoma. So that's one of the organizations that I'm a part of. And then another organization that I'm personally a part of uh, where I sit on the uh, advisory board is the, is, is, is a, uh, a charity called the NIA Project. So what we've done with the NIA Project uh, here in South Florida, um, every single summer, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 students at no cost to them, we've been able and fortunate enough to raise money for them to participate in experiential learning in, in different countries, you know, around the world. So we've been fortunate enough to send players, I mean, not players, but uh, students to uh, Namibia and Africa, South Africa, um, the UK, Costa Rica, Ghana, um, and this is sometimes for some of these kids. I was fortunate enough to go on one of the trips with trips with with the, with the students um, to South Africa um, and to a few other countries, um, and that was some of those those students' first times on a plane. So you know, just exposing those inner city kids and inner city youth to you know something that's you know bigger than me, bigger than us, bigger than you know sport um, and athletes being able to provide that, and you know me personally being able to do that with the platform that I've been given and you know fortunate enough to have you know, I think is invaluable to, to, to definitely always pay it forward, you know, when, you, when you're in a position to do so. And I love hearing those stories, brother, as a guy who grew up in Texas and my father's from Nigeria, I've had the opportunity to go to Africa several times mm -hmm. and to be a Texan and to see some people that I know that are that haven't got a chance to travel 
outside of that bubble that you live in or that you grew up in, just to hear that is amazing, man. If anybody gets a chance to travel, I mean, go get that passport, travel. It's just so such a great opportunity to see to see the world. And uh, I just love hearing that, brother. I commend you on that. Absolutely appreciate that. It's something that, you know, I think uh, our guys respect too, because you're not only, you know, just telling them to do that, you're actually living it yourself. You know, same thing as, you know, you're, you're, you're in player development, you're a trainer, like, you know, you, you play this play sports. So, you know, when guys see that as someone that's actually living and doing exactly what they're telling you to do, you know, that, that comes with a different type of credibility and different type of respect. So, you know, that, that, that's also, you know, not part of the reason, but it also helps to, to, to kind of get our message across in terms of what we're trying to, you know, shape and do for, for, for these generations of athletes. You know, shaping athletes of, of tomorrow. You're also involved with the basketball league. You know, uh, yeah. I saw your title, you know, your vice president of player representation. You know, mm -hmm. talk about the basketball league. And, you know, you have so many other leagues around the country that are, are I don't want to say rivaling the NBA, rivaling the G League, but just more opportunities for, for players. So just give us some insight on the basketball league and uh, what your job duties are with that league. Oh, great. Um, yeah. They, so the TBL, the basketball league, as you, as, as you mentioned, um, so I've been in, in communication with the commissioner um, of that league, you know, David Magley, who was actually the, one of the commissioners and founders of the uh, NBL Canada league, which, which, you know, has, has done a phenomenal job, you know, up there in Canada. Um, and when he started this TBL league, you know, I thought it was a great opportunity for, you know, guys that, you know, didn't qualify or didn't make it overseas during the season to still have a platform where they could play here in the States and, you know, still make money and be compensated for, you know, their, their, their pro abilities. Um, and, uh, it, you know, their league starts a little bit later than the international market. So, you know, a lot of guys that, you know, miss out on that first wave of not being able to report to a team in September or October, you know, for, for whatever reason it may be, you know, that league starting in December provides them with still a year to allow them to still get current film, still get current content, still get current stats that they can eventually use to market for, you know, their next pro playing opportunity. Um, right now that league has, I believe it's 12 teams in the league. Um, they are expanding, I believe next season to have 14 teams. So they're continuing to grow. Um, you know, there's about 140 players in the league. Um, our specific involvement as an agency is that we are the agency of record. Uh, for all of those 140 players to assist them in sourcing opportunities, whether it be at the international or G League level, um, as they, you know, continue to grow and develop, whether it be in season, a team comes and says, hey, you know, we need a point guard, or, hey, we need a small forward, hey, we need a big, um, you know, we have, you know, 140 players to choose from to kind of give them and say, hey, you know, you can choose from, from these, these list of players that we have that, you know, are, are pros you know, playing well in, in, in the TBL. So, um, with that said, you know, that gives us access to 140 guys as an agency that we can also represent and market. And then outside of that, um, you know, me personally, I was given the title of B VP of Player Representation, uh, where I work alongside um, our VP of Business Operations, uh, Kenosha Chastain, who kind of handles, handles the operational aspect of, 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 of the program that we have, and that's called uh, the TBL agencies, uh, so to speak. So, um, yeah, great opportunity, you know, for what we've been able to do with, with, with the players that are in that league. And, you know, again, the TBL is doing some phenomenal things. I think, you know, obviously it's not the NBA, it's not the G League, but it is the third best league in the U.S. that is paid, you know, at a professional level um, for guys to create a resume and create a profile to be able to market themselves for, you know, their, their, their next playing opportunity. Before I went overseas as a strength and conditioning coach, I didn't even know they had strength coaches overseas. Mm -hmm. And at that particular time, I went over 2008, uh, 2000, excuse me, 2009, and all you ever heard of a guy was, you know, going to the league. I got to get to the league. I got to get to the league. And, you know, but you, you always heard about players playing overseas, but it's like they never where, like where they play at. You know, so what, yeah. what kind of guys, that, you know, what do you sit down with guys that are really probably the best opportunity for them to play internationally to get that exposure, make their money, have a good, have a good fruitful career overseas? What those conversations like? Yeah, um, we, we kind of have a very, you know, thorough process and strategy. And, and you know, we always say uh, when we're talking to, you know, new recruits or new, new prospects that we're looking to bring to the agency, we take kind of a holistic approach to the way we represent our guys. You know, some agencies, you know, specialize in just working with NBA players and G League players. You know, other agency only specialize in working in, you know, with international players and even more specifically just – you know, you'll hear agents say, hey, we have great contacts in Greece or Spain or, you know, Asia. Um, you know, we don't work that way. Like I said, we take a more holistic approach. So, you know, a testament to that is, you know, of the 41 players that we represented this past season, 
Um, we were fortunate, to, fortunate enough to place players on six different continents and in over 18 different countries. So, you know, with that said, we've been able to place players in Australia, uh, the NBA's newly formed Basketball Africa League, which unfortunately was postponed due to Corona. Um, you know, that was in their first year that they, they actually rolled out a league outside of the, uh, outside of the NBA on another continent. Um, been able to place players in Asia, um, where you have some experience working over there. Been able to place players throughout Europe, South America. Uh, we had three players in the G League this past year and players up in Canada. So, you know, kind of what that said is that the holistic approach that we take is, you know, we kind of do a check down. You know, let's say we have a prospect that, you know, fits the criteria for, you know, being a great international player, but we always want to vet it out. We always want to say, okay, let's reach out to all 30 NBA teams, all 28 G League teams, and then our internal database of 2,500 plus international teams that we have and start to source and gauge feedback over kind of the first, you know, 15 to 30 days of working with a specific player. So that's kind of what our process looks like. Um, once we get that feedback, we kind of bring, you know, bring what we have, the pros and cons of every, every, every single situation that has been presented to us and the feedback that we've gotten and present that to the player. Uh, kind of the next phase in that is, you know, if a guy gets a look for, let's say he's going to be drafted or undrafted, or if he's going to get a summer league look, you know, obviously we bet that opportunity and, you know, the guy goes and plays the summer league. If he doesn't get a summer league opportunity or summer league look, you know, we may recommend some international exposure camps that he should attend, you know, in Vegas during the NBA summer league period so that he's still getting maximum exposure with those international teams that are in Vegas during that time, um, as well as those G League teams and some NBA teams that are also in Vegas during that time. So that's kind of the check down process that we take, you know, come July. And then between that, you know, August time period is usually when most international and also G League promises or NBA opportunities, if you weren't drafted, are kind of presented to our guys. And we kind of look at the pros and cons of each opportunity before we make a decision to say, hey, you know, you're going to report overseas during these first two weeks of September for this job that was presented. Or, hey, you know, we're going to pass on these overseas opportunities and pursue the G League because we got some great feedback saying that this G League team really sees you as a priority, you know, in their organization. So we're going to pass on these international opportunities and pursue the G League training camp you know, come October or if it's an NBA look, you know, and, you know, and there's a lucrative offer overseas, you know, we kind of weigh the pros and cons. Does it make sense to go to training camp if you're not going to be guaranteed, you know, with this NBA team or do we kind of, you know, better on our chances and kind of go to training camp, you know, during, you know, September with this NBA team and, 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 and kind of see, see where we fall. Um, so that's kind of the check down process that we do across the, across the board. And again, like I said, we take a holistic approach to the way we represent our guys um, and kind of don't want to leave any stone unturned. So it's a check down process from the NBA to the G League you know, to the international marketplace. Okay, yeah, just very interested in hearing that because like I, when I worked overseas and I worked with guys, you know, some of the guys may be former NBA guys, uh, like mm -hmm. a good friend of the show, uh, Mo Spates, you know, he yep. came, he was with me in China uh, yep. during his, uh, after he left the NBA. Um, but some guys, you know, think like when they get over to China, they use that springboard to get back into the NBA or when they get over yeah. to, you know, uh, France or Turkey or whatever, Russia, whatever country they're in, you know, players got to understand that when they get over there, you, you know, you still got opportunities to, to get you, you know, the, the scouts is all the scouts and GMs and people, they always going to find you. You know, of course, of course. And that, and then we do a good job of that too, because, you know, <clears throat> at the end of the day, we never want to sell or, or cut anybody's dream short. So, you know, playing at the highest level that their talents can take them. So we always are continuing to, to vet, you know, that process out for them, even while they're overseas playing, you know, we're, we're in constant communication with them and letting them know, Hey, you know, these are the looks and, you know, potential offers that you have. If you do come back over, you know, certain guys are you using their opportunity overseas as a springboard to get to, you know, an ultimate goal. But for every guy, that's not the case. Some guys are happy with, you know, having a long standing career overseas. You know, other guys are still looking to, you know, to pursue and chase the dream of playing at the highest level, you know, whether it be NBA or, you know, or, or the highest level overseas. So what we do is, you know, we continue to market our guys, you know, their film, not only, you know, when they're a rookie, not only when they're a free agent, but also when they have their current playing contract in whatever market that may be so that they continue to stay on the radars of, you know, NBA and G League teams if they, you know, ever want to come back across the waters and, and use that opportunity. Okay, well, I appreciate that, brother. Hey. I, I, I can't let you leave without talking about your extra medium uh, polo shirt. <laughs> hey, hey, you, hey, you in South Florida, you know, sun's out, guns out. You know, if anybody ever followed your IG page, you stay in the gym, you stay working out, you stay getting right. They mentioned yeah. ago, you, uh, a second ago, you mentioned, you know, you got to basically walk it like you talk it, you know, with your, with yeah. your clients, you know, so you got to put that work in. You know, Absolutely. so I just want to, hey, look, as a training conditioning coach, I just want to come in you, but I always see you in the gym. You know, I know we don't talk that much on, on social media, but I see what, I see the workouts you putting in. You in there getting that, get it in. You and the wife. 
Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, just trying to stay healthy, man. Just trying to stay healthy. That's that's my competitive drive, you know. I don't, I can't hoop like I used to, so I got to take it out in some in some other respect, in some other regard. So I take it out in the gym, man. <laughs> well, my brother, I appreciate you coming on No Referees podcast today, uh, sharing some of your stories, giving us the insight of what it's like behind the scenes, behind the lens of the the pen and paper, the contract negotiations. Well, some people misnomers think people might not understand, people might not hear about or not understand. So I appreciate you giving us uh, some insight on that. You know, everyone, please go follow uh, Danny on at his Instagram page at dgreen23 and follow, please follow uh, Green Sports Manager on their IG and Twitter page at Green Sports MGMT. And that's our brother, man. Thanks for showing up, man. Thanks for, for, for coming and visiting us today on, on the podcast. Danny Green, man. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Uh, enjoyed, enjoyed our conversation and, and look forward to, 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 to continue conversations in the future. Yeah, me too, brother. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. All right. Sounds good, man. Have a good one. Stay safe. You too. Thanks for listening to another episode of the No Referees Podcast. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening to this show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to follow us on social media at No Referees Pod. To the next episode, we out.